So I'd like to welcome everybody to our uh, monthly um, EVCO meeting. Uh, so uh, I've got this slide here in, in commemoration of our, our friends in Ukraine, as we've done over the last uh, few few months. Uh, so today is the 25th of April, and uh, this is the agenda we have for today. So um, I want to first start by thanking CAA. There are, uh, what they've uh, CAA has done is they've provided the funding necessary to wrap the trailer that we have for the EV experience. And I'll, I'll show a picture of that later when we get through the meeting. Uh, but essentially, uh, for today, the agenda is uh, Purelator is here as a special guest, and they'll talk about a project that they're doing uh, to uh, do the electric, um, do last mile delivery using electrified transportation. Very exciting project that um, that they're working on, uh, but I'll, I'll, I won't steal their thunder on that. Then we'll talk about some updates of the uh, EV experience project. So uh, we did an interesting thing today with uh, with the team at Enviro Center. So we'll talk about that and a few other things. Uh, then, as usual, we'll go through EV news. Uh, so uh, lots of EV news again uh, this month. And then we'll uh, we'll go through the uh, past and future events. So uh, I've got a calendar that's a lot more complete than what we had last month in term of in terms of what we are projecting uh, to have um, for the. Um, for the upcoming uh, season, okay? So, and then of course we'll do the roundtable as we do usually. So I think there are, are folks that uh, from Pru later are on. So what I'll do is uh, I'll switch over to uh, that presentation. And um, I'm not sure who from Pure Later uh, will be um, will be presenting, but if you could unmute yourself and uh, just let me know when you'd like to um, uh, to move to the next slide and I'll be happy to do that, okay? Great, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. So, Cindy Bailey, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick us off here with the presentation, and then I'm also going to be uh, turning it over to uh, Chris Henry, who's our director of fleet, and Khalil, that who leads our R and D work. So, thank you very much for uh, inviting us this evening to speak with you a little bit. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. So, I'm just gonna share with you a little bit of a an overview, and then Chris is going to take you through sort of, uh, you know, where we, what we've been working on in terms of our fleet electrification program, and then where we're uh, hoping to get to and some next steps. So just very high level. Um, I just wanted to share with you, so five years ago, uh, sorry, in 2019, um, Purelator announced our five-year, $1 billion delivering the future growth and innovation strategy. So this is a, a large um, program where we have put aside a lot of money for different strategic pillars for the organization. And one of them is environmental sustainability. So this is going to include a lot of funds invested in greening our buildings and our vehicles. And the reason that we've done this is because uh, Purelator is looking to actually be Canada's greenest career. So this is this is essentially what our vision is, our long-term vision is that we're working towards. So to do that, of course, we need to integrate sustainable practices into all areas of our business, and we need to set very ambitious goals related to uh, both our emissions and our waste. Also in 2019, when we announced our innovation strategy, we also announced our ambition to uh, reach net zero emissions by 2050. So this is something we've been actively working on over the last year or so, is trying to identi identify the pathway and the roadmap to achieving that by 2050. So the first thing that we're doing is we're actually working on setting um, a science-based target right now. So we have signed the commitment letter with the Science-Based Targets Initiative, and we plan to release our 2030 greenhouse gas emissions reduction goal uh, later this year in our next sustainability report. Next slide, please. So part of, uh, part of announcing our goal will also be to speak to the pathways that are going to allow us to reduce our emissions in line with net zero by 2050. So this slide really just highlights some of the key pathways that we're gonna to need to take in order to achieve that. 
So the first one, of course, is related to our fleet, and, and that's uh, a lot of what we're going to be talking to you guys about today. So essentially investing in alternative fuel vehicles, as well as other uh, low carbon technologies such as carbon capture. We're also going to be setting a goal around renewable electricity. So as we electrify our fleet, uh, it's also going to be important that we're taking our electricity from renewable sources. We're also focusing on our facilities, reducing our waste, as well as installing energy efficient equipment in our facilities. We're finding ways to be more to optimize our operations. So we're looking at uh, the different routes that we use for our vehicles. We're using telematics and other tools to help us uh, cut waste within our operations, reduce our fuel consumption and travel fewer kilometers. Next slide, please. So just to sort of set the stage for where we're going next in terms of fleet electrification, this just kind of gives you a sense of our greenhouse gas emissions profile and why electrifying our fleet is really, really critical to, to Purolator meeting those very ambitious greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. So you can see here our scope one emissions is, is, is a significant piece of the pie. So this is really where our fleet electrification is going to fit in. So this is the vehicles that we both own and operate that are primarily contributing to the scope one emissions that you see there. And then within scope three, the vast majority of the emissions there is going to be our subcontracted uh, transportation services. So when you bring all of this together, you can see that our uh, our emissions that are coming from our transportation, so that's our ground fleet, air and rail operations, make up 92% of our total emissions pie. So that's why it's really important for us to focus in on all of the different modes of transportation we have within our business and find ways to, uh, to green this and to reduce our emissions. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to turn it over to Chris Henry, who's our director of fleet, and he's going to take you through some of the fleet electrification work that we have done to date and what some of our next steps will be. Over to you, Chris. Great. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, and thank you, uh, all of you, to uh, allowing us for to uh, come here tonight to make this presentation. I appreciate your time. So if we just want to move on to the next slide. So just you know, a little bit of, you know, why are, why are we going through electrification? And, and, you know, I think, you know, outside of the government regulations, you know, a couple of key aspects for us to be able to justify our rationale to going into electrification. Um, you know, the, the key highlights here, again, financial, environmental, health and safety, reputation, and, you know, motivation, employer brand. You know, financially, you know, you can make an argument, you know, certainly right now that, it may not be cost beneficial to involve, get yourself involved in electrification because of the cost of the vehicles and the batteries. Uh, however, when you look at kind of the long-term curve with respect to things like maintenance um, and, and you, you know, the cost of electricity versus fuel in the long-term, you know, these things are really going to weigh heavily on the ability uh, of this industry to grow. And so it's, it's, it's significant in the fact that um, while you know the 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 cost of an ice uh, ice vehicle right now may be you know maybe about you know half the cost of uh, an electric vehicle. Over time, we certainly expect that that ice vehicle is going to increase, uh, and that the cost of ice engines is going to increase. And while electric will come down, and the cost of batteries themselves will even out as technology goes forward. You know, I think environmental is you know it speaks for itself. You know, on the health and safety side. You know, what we see is things like the, the, the positioning of battery packs and how battery packs work on the vehicle itself, you know, provides you know, a lower center of gravity um, for the vehicle, helps to improve handling and these kinds of things. So we look at those elements as well, not just the fact that, you know, you know, the combustion of fuel and that kind of thing, but for, you know, the noise elements that these vehicles emit. Our drivers, you know, typically, you know, have to put up a lot of noise rattling and, and, and components as their vehicles drive. So, you know, to have those components you know, whittle down as they drive as well, it was another element for us to consider. You know, I think reputation, uh, again, you know, the pub what the public thinks of us, what our customers think of us is very important. Our customers are very motivated to be involved in, uh, you know, greening and zero emissions. So if they're, you know, it's important to them, it's important to us. So that's another, you know, one of the key elements in terms of why we want to move and advance our fleet into electrification. 
Uh, and finally, you know, motivation and, and an employer brand. You know, when we've already started to, started to talk about electrification with our staff, uh, they've become very excited. For those that have been able to engage in some of the electric vehicles that we've used, uh, the feedback has been nothing short of, of fantastic. So this is one of those things that hopefully we can attract more people to our organization as well. Um, and, you know, as a brand out there, you know, pure later, you know, we want to grow our brand within the communities. We want to be strong community supporters. So these elements all kind of roll together to help us, you know, advance electrification, simply not for the fact of, you know, reducing GHG and like all those are extremely important, but there is a myriad of pieces that all go into to why we want to move our fleet forward. Go to the next slide, please. So, you know, when we green our fleet, you know, what a couple of things we started to do as we, you know, introduced a couple of pieces, you know, we were lucky enough to win an award for green our fleet uh, back in 2021. Um, you know, we're also part of other solutions and, and, and other initiatives in terms of uh, helping to, you know, green and protect our environment. So we're happy to be a part of a growing organization <laughs> that helping us set the table and push these pieces forward. Um, you know, we want to, you know, to strive to, to move our fleet forward, to, to allow us to, you know, advance our technology. And wherever we can be part of communities to be able to do so, uh, you know, we want to do that. Um, and what we've done so far in, in green our fleet is launch several different vehicles uh, to, to promote the electrification and, and, uh, and essentially zero emissions. So we've introduced a low-speed vehicle, 11 e-bikes, and five all-electric step vans. We've made them, we've put those in different geographies uh, across the country, uh, Montreal, uh, Richmond, BC, uh, and some pieces uh, in, in Toronto. So we're testing at this point in time. We're, we're putting out there to see how our, our operation, for the most part, is going to work, uh, how they're going to, uh, uh, how they're going to deliver in the, in, the, uh, in the environment they're in from a reliability perspective. So we're, we're at the very, you know, the very young and infant sta infancy stage here of deploying uh, electric, electric vehicles uh, to our fleet. Next slide, please. So just a couple of pictures here of, of how we've, you know, engaged with them inside of our operations. So for the most part, what you're seeing here is the deployment of our, of our low speed vehicle and our e-bikes. Uh, we, we have a certain sorting method, methodology we have to put in place. It does affect the way we process and manage our operations. So again, it just isn't about seeing, you know, what the range is and how far we can go in electricity and is it environmentally friendly, all these pieces. But we have to take a look and see at how it merges into our operations and what impact is going to have on our operations. So as we ran this, this uh, test in Montreal, we had to go into different sort methodologies to be able to deliver these on the ground. Um, so they were highly effective. Our team is, is quite good at adapting processes. You know, and you'll see from Khalil Khalil, who come after me, um, we, we work through a lot of, of P&D component, or sorry, uh, um, R&D components here that, that you know, that are, are fairly well thought out in terms of how we're going to deliver. Them. Um, you know, what we'll see and what we already know is it's, it's not as easy as just, you know, buying a, deliver, or buying a vehicle, putting in place and, and starting delivering packages. You know, you have to think of the entire uh, ecosystem that is, you know, the transport and logistics world to understand how they're going to be able to adapt to our business. And so in the short term, what we found is, is these vehicles have adapted quite well, our staff has adapted quite well, and we've had to change a few processes, but they have an impact that are affected our business uh, for the most part. Uh, next slide, please. So a, a little bit about our, our test vehicles. Um, you know, there are some good and bad with every test. So as we started to deploy our units in Montreal and Richmond, you know, we took a look at a few things. So first and foremost, productivity. Um, our productivity was, was really, uh, was quite high. And in the cases where either our productivity was either the same or comparable to actually a van driving in the downtown core. Um, one piece of this very important for us, no parking tickets. So uh, we incur a lot of parking tickets by parking in downtown cores. Uh, and of course, no consumption of fuel. The important part here, though, is on the productivity is that we were able to see that at least in, in, in most cases, we were able to at least replace one step van with a e-bike in there in our downtowns when we were executing them. Um, again, there's a lot. It's a lot more efficient to ride these bikes, whether it potentially might be on sidewalks or through side streets, uh, places where we don't have to drive around in circles to be able to park our vans. So, you know, a, a 
a couple of uh, really important components to being able to use these smaller, more nimble vehicles. Uh, the feedback from our riders was, was extremely strong. Um, they've enjoyed riding the e-bike. You know, they like the exercise component of it. Um, and we got a lot of, you know, they, they commented on the wow factor that people would see these driving on the streets, talk to our couriers, engage them. You know, they want to understand more about what courier, or Pure Later's kind of green, uh, green proposal was for, you know, for putting these pieces in market. So, you know, we had a lot of good feedback. You know, what we've learned, though, in terms of as we begin to put the bikes and these other pieces in place, we've had challenges with some of the vehicles. Not to be unexpected, no different than deploying any other new vehicle. And uh, it doesn't matter whether we're deploying trucks or, or other pieces. When we put new ones in market, there's always issues and always challenges. Um, you know, part of this is, you know, these, these, these vehicles are riding on, you know, rough streets, rugged streets, potholes. They're being run eight, nine hours a day. So we had some challenges with the frames, with the wheels. Um, but certainly it's important to note that road conditions play an important part on being able to bring these vehicles. Um, and in the case, we've, we're testing some other LSVs in, in, in the marketplace. There, again, some challenges with different varieties of vehicles in terms of what our use case is. So it may be different for you or for what you're doing, but for our use case, some of these were, were a little bit problematic. Um, but, you know, this is why we test these. We run them through. We don't take them in large numbers. We don't roll out, you know, 60, 70 vehicles at a time until we have, you know, some base case to, to go through it. So, so far, uh, we were, uh, we, we were uh, uh, you know, doing quite well. Uh, the picture in the middle is just a reference. One of the challenges we had was the bike frame cracking. So that's just showing where the bike frame cracked. So again, it's one of these things we just want to show that there is no, you know, uh, you know, one one run solution for everything. So we've actually had to work uh, with with the R and D team to to find other options to be able to put these on the road. So uh, uh, again, it's all part of the test on how we have to run these vehicles through. Uh, next slide, please. This next slide is a little bit about the performance of our electric step vans. So in Richmond, BC, we contracted with a company called Motive. Uh, Motive inserted the electrical engines for us, uh, and they're responsible for the maintenance and, and managing the vehicles. Um, we deployed five vehicles pretty much a year ago now, um, and they were assigned to just strictly downtown routes in Vancouver. We wanted to limit, it, uh, limit the number of kilometers these vehicles were going to drive just to understand how they were going to work. Um, the great news here is that you know, these vehicles actually lived up to their promise from the manufacturer. Uh, we used a minimal amount of charge on a daily basis. And in fact, we didn't have to charge these vehicles every day if we didn't want to, based on the kilometers they were driven. Their pieces per hour, their stops per hour were the equivalent of any other vehicle. Uh, their maintenance and uptime, as you can see by the charts here, were extremely high. Uh, we were able to maintain a 96.7 uptime. Uh, our average is around 92 with all of our other vehicles. So these vehicles were very reliable. Um, we didn't drive a ton of miles, uh, as it were, but also the maintenance was extremely low. Uh, we only had a couple times where, if you look at that fleet uptime chart, where you see some of these blips, we had some problems unrelated to the electrical uh, components of the vehicle, more so on the body that we had to work on that kept that vehicle up all the time. So, so far, you know, the, the five vehicles we have, you know, went through all the tests we had uh, there. Uh, we even tested the range at one point in time to max out the range. Uh, the vehicle did not make it back, uh, but it was awfully close. Um, it went for about 150 kilometers, and we were only seven kilometers short of returning back to the terminal, uh, and then just had to recharge it a couple times to get it back. But it was good to understand what the actual uh, maximum range was, and the maximum range, again, was consistent with what the manufacturer had suggested. Uh, what's important was the usage of the kilowatt per hour. Uh, if you look around at many vehicles right now, the average kilowatt per kilometer is over one, 1.2, 1.3. These vehicles were sticking under under one, which is important for us again, just in terms of overall charging, you know, the cost to charge. So so far, based on these five, we had very positive results from our electric vehicles in market. And uh, as uh, as a result of this, we're going to expand uh, into a larger uh, a larger test going forward uh, this year. Um, you go to the next page. Sorry, just just a quick question before we go further. So, when you're talking about a step van, you're talking about just to be clear, the the uh, traditional pure liter van that you would expect to see going to your place, right? Correct. We we it's a class five 18 foot step van. 
yeah. with uh, for those of you who might know, it's an E59 Ford chassis that we we built it on, um, and that is it's it's our largest uh, delivery vehicle, our step van vehicle that we run. Okay, and they were converted by uh, Motive, right? The engines were converted by Motive, yes. Okay. So cool. we we buy a we buy a, a, a an engine chassis. It's deleted, and Motive does the conversion for us. So, uh, I'm not sure what that question is. Sorry, I don't. Uh, there's a question there. I, I don't know if some of you want to just comment on their question. I'm not sure. I saw it very quickly. Hi, sorry, there, the, oh, sorry. Go ahead, uh, Spencer. Sorry about that. The uh, <clears throat> uh, the just is there a comparison for the last graph to uh, ICE vehicles? You obviously have ICE vehicles for the amount of maintenance and and uh, range and whatnot uh, for gasoline vehicles. In, so in a comparison. The, yeah. So if you want to go back a slide, I'll just I, I'll give it to you verbally here. Um, if you want to go back one. If, if I could also sort of have a similar question and kind of what what do you find your uh, ICE vehicle sort of uh, uh, use of the, the gas? I got into the electrification because I found that I was wasting a lot of gas idling and I would think that Purewater would be a company that sort of you wouldn't have very efficient uh, uh, vehicles in the sense that a lot of the time your vehicles are stopped or not moving very quickly. So what's what is the average sort of miles per gallon or miles per hundred kilometers for one of your step vans? Yeah, so uh, if I, I'm just going to recall correctly, but I believe it's around 14, uh, 14 kilometers per hundred. Uh, it's, it's a little bit high because we do do a lot of idling. Uh, you know, now we don't run a lot of kilometers. I mean, our average vehicle runs 100 kilometers per day, so we don't drive a ton, but we do idle quite a bit, certainly in urban and suburban uh, uh, regions. Uh, you know, when you're up in, you know, North Bay or something, the routes are a lot longer. They're 250, you know, kilometers long. Uh, but certainly, you know, we are not a fuel, you know, efficient type of vehicle. Um, you know, again, we, we, we don't run a lot, but we do idle quite a bit that drives it. From a fleet uptime perspective, you know, this vehicle was up at 96.7. Our fleet averages on our uptime around 92 and a half, and that's all ICE vehicles. So they sit around uh, 92 and a half in terms of their uptime. Uh, and roughly, you know, their maintenance, you know, we do, we do, we have a PM cycle and schedule these vehicles follow it, but when you look at the overall cost, it's about one third the cost that we've had in our maintenance cycle for an electric vehicle compared to our ICE vehicles of the same size and same shape. Now we haven't had them more than a year, so there'll be more wear and tear in these vehicles. So you would expect them to be very low in the first year. So it's not surprising that it would be that low, but we expect it to maintain at that level. You know, we, so we're still replacing tires, we're still replacing brakes, that doesn't change, uh, but you know anything to do with the powertrain, we don't have to touch. There's no fluids, anything like that. So it's it's time in the shop actually is quite low. Our typical our typical turnaround time is about three hours for a vehicle when it goes in. Uh, this one is less than an hour. Okay, so so brakes actually. Let's let's uh, talk about that for a second. So how often do you need to replace brakes compared to your gas vehicles? Or actually, I don't know. Do these do regenerative uh, braking, or do they not? They have regenerative braking. Okay. So, but there's still all components that we do have to work on. We haven't had to touch the brakes on these vehicles yet. Okay. Uh, but on an on an ICE vehicle, uh, we'll do every second PM. We will likely change our brakes out. So, depending on what province you're in, the PMs vary. But you're looking at roughly every six months we're changing brake pads. Wow. Okay. OK, so you want to go on to the, the next slide there. So uh, a couple of components that we've learned, you know, regenerative braking actually is, is quite an interesting piece because it changes driver behavior and how they drive. Um, not our vehicles aren't one touch drive yet, but we're looking at a lot that are, but they very rarely have to touch their brakes. And the use of how they drive actually can, you know, can work to charge the vehicles more effectively for us. So, you know, depending on how we train and teach our drivers to drive, the regenerative braking actually is, is a really uh, uh, interesting 
type of technology that allow us to drive further on electric vehicles if used effectively and used properly. And no different than the batteries, the regenerative braking, you know, they're getting better and better every year. Um, I took a vehicle out just yesterday, a different, another competitive vehicle uh, for a test drive. Uh, sorry, that was last week. And uh, we did about a two kilometer circuit. I didn't have to test a brake other than starting the car or starting the vehicle. Um, so these things are getting better. And this is going to be, you know, for the drivers themselves, you know, you eliminate driver fatigue from going back and forth to the brake all, to all the time. Instant stop and go by taking your foot off the gas pedal. Uh, you avoid, you know, not that you have to worry about idling for electric vehicles, but it's it's a real, it's a much more enjoyable drive when you're there. Uh, the range we got in our vehicles was projected at 150 kilometers, and that's when we we maxed it out. We got our 150 kilometers, and again, you know, as we've heard, uh, you know, the ranges will change. We'll improve every single year with these batteries. Uh, our version of the motive truck, we're getting a new vehicle, and already they've extended the range by 30 kilometers based on a similar style, just some upgrades to their battery pack. And by the time we get to the next version of the vehicle, it'll go up another 30 kilometers. And other vehicles are driving two and 300 kilometers, depending on their size, in class two and class three vehicles, not so much class four and five like we're driving. Um, so the, the range is improving all the time and we got the range that we anticipated. Um, from a stop and go perspective, this was one issue that we had. Um, there is that when you start back up again, an electric vehicle, there is a delay. There is a bit of a pause with the vehicles we had. So that's some feedback we've given to the manufacturer to, to improve upon that. And also there is a bit of, you know, you get an instant power surge when you, when you push down on that battery. So we've actually had to train the drivers to kind of ease into the stop and goes as well, because it is a, it is a bit challenging. And the battery modules. So this is one thing we're going to be looking at extensively as we go forward, how many batteries actually to put in a vehicle. For our vehicles and our vehicle range, um, you know, most, most companies have a standard offering of batteries. We may be able, be able to go lower than that standard offering, uh, mainly because we simply don't drive all that far in most of our routes. So, you know, there's some cost savings, some time savings, some charging savings that we might look at, uh, and also weight. Um, the, uh, the batteries are extremely heavy. Um, so we, uh, we in BC, we've come right to the very max of the GRBW uh, in, on the step vans in Vancouver. Um, so we actually have to watch how much we load on the vehicles because it is getting close to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, provincial standards. And so those battery weights as they go forward are going to be important. So for those of you looking at it, you know, make sure you understand the type of vehicle and the class of vehicle you're buying and the weight of that battery. It may actually push you up into another class of vehicle entirely. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. So there's a few things that we're working on here. We're, we're building our plans for 2022 right now. Um, and a lot of this, again, stems off what you'll hear from Khalil Khalil right afterwards. We begin to say, okay, we want to put these in place, but what are we going to do? How are we going to manage it? And this is just kind of, I won't go through it, but just kind of a laundry list um, in, inside, these, uh, inside these pieces that we need to take a look at uh, as we go forward to ensure that these work in our environment. Um, to answer the question, no, we haven't tested in cold weather yet. That is what we're going to be doing here going forward uh, as we look at it. We'll be putting them in cold weather environments. So, I mean, you, you can take a look at this. I'll let you read at your leisure. But these are things we are going to be testing as we go forward. We are going to get data to take a look and see what type of vehicle we're going to work with and what, what OEM we, uh, we will be testing and what, what their results are going to be. So we're going to compare you know, OEMs to OEMs as we start to go forward. Um, next, uh, next slide, please. Um, and so there's a little bit of a, you know, in this case, chicken and the egg, and we're we're facing this right now. Uh, I've said the numerous times to to several people, we're we're kind of running with scissors right now here, um, because you know we want to bring in vehicles, but the important part here is that you have to have the infrastructure to support it. And with each one you've got, there are different, um, you know, different risks and challenges with buying a vehicle and then providing the infrastructure. Uh, so for us right now, we have a lot of old buildings, a lot of old terminals. We have to upgrade the infrastructure. We have to put more electrical in to be able to support the vehicles. The other side of the coin is, well, we won't buy the vehicles. We have to, you know, we have to get in line. So if you want to try and buy an electric vehicle right now, uh, a lot of the times they're not available because they're still in production. And if you are buying them and they are in production, you know, you have to get in line behind some of the other majors that are out there buying them, whether that be FedEx, UPS, Walmart. Uh, USPS, these things. So we we faced a bit of that. 
you know, we've been lucky that we've had a really good relationship with a few uh, OEMs. And so we're, we're clear at the front of the line to, to get our vehicles. But, you know, there, there's cost implications. There are supply chain implications right now. So for those of you, you know, buying vehicles, whether it's semiconductors, uh, whether it's just getting aluminum supply chain, you'll see all those are, are working against us right now. So um, even if you have the cash, sometimes there isn't supply to get it because of those. So we face both sides of the coin. What should we do first? Should we buy get infrastructure? Should we buy the trucks and hope we get the trucks before we get the infrastructure set up? So we're facing those challenges right now. Um, I'll let you know how we get through them because we're not through them yet. Um, but uh, you know, we're 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 going to be you know spending a lot of time getting close to the OEMs, getting close to the manufacturers to ensure that the supply, not only in the vehicles but on the electrical side, is available for us to upgrade our facilities. Uh, next, next slide. So what we're going to test here is uh, we're buying elect 100 electric vehicles. We're going to electrify three to four of our facilities. Going to install, elect inst install electric charging stations and infrastructure in these same terminals. And what we'll do is we're going to be assessing the operation. How do they work in the operation? How reliable are they? How is the infrastructure going to respond? And what are our future opportunities? And this is going to help us build our future roadmap to electrification. Uh, we don't anticipate that whatever we do now will be what we're doing in five years, but we're going to learn. Uh, and that's the important part here is to understand how it affects our operations. Um, because, you know, no one else has really done this yet so far um, in terms on a larger scale. So we're going to be these, you know, kind of the, some of the guinea pigs for, for many um, uh, that are working. And so we're, uh, we're going to be putting this in place. Uh, and spending a lot of time with a lot of people to understand the impact and effect they're going to have on our business and also assess how these vehicles work. Uh, again, capabilities, you know, you mentioned weather, there's also geography, you know, hills, uh, humidity, these all work against the battery. So we need to understand these, you know, ranges, different ranges, uh, different weights and capacities. Uh, we have on our routes that we drive every day, we have different weights and capacities in our vehicle. So we have to understand the right vehicle for the right route that we're going to put in place as well. So there's all kinds of variables we need to examine. And so we're going to be doing that. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't see, I, I missed that last question in the chat. I don't know if you wanted to. The question was, uh, will these vehicles offer a vehicle to grid technology? So I don't know if you're, you're aware of that, yep. of what that is, okay. Yeah, so some of them will, yes. So depending on the technology installed and on board, so the as and as we go forward and start to build our infrastructure, we'll be looking to implement that as we go forward. Because what we want to do, as part of kind of our larger GHG, uh, 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 you know, program, is make sure that these vehicles work in concert with our terminals, uh, you know, with our, our our overall infrastructure, just not for the vehicles themselves. Uh, you know, certainly smart charging will be involved. Uh, but you know, how do we you know gen self generate you know, solar power, wind power, all these kinds of things, and how we can uh, uh, charge our vehicles. So that is definitely part of the consideration. We won't likely have it early on, uh, but we'll wait and see. But it is something, and you'll see this from Khalil as we go forward. So yeah, it's, I'd see a bit of a challenge for you guys uh, because your vehicles are out on the street essentially all the time during daytime, aren't they? Right? For the most part, yes. The most part. So, yeah, but uh, it'd be interesting to see what you could do with that. Cool. Next slide, then. Do you qualify for the ultra low, ultra low overnight rate? Again, that depends on the uh, utility and municipality that we're in. We're investigating that right now, and we'll continue to take a look at that. Yeah. So, so Craig, that that rate is mostly for consumer level uh, applications. When you're a bigger consumer, like uh, Purelator, uh, I don't know if you would have any Class A contracts or not, but you're into different types of electrical supply contracts that uh, that have other other considerations so. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, next slide and I'll just try and uh, finish it off right here I believe yeah, there we go so uh, okay I'll ask wouldn't you worry about the battery wear for uh, VTG it depends so um, you know it depends how you're charging it uh, and what type of chargers you're getting into uh, and how you can, you know, downstream or downgrade the electricity into the vehicle. 
Uh, we don't plan to go with level three chargers for the most part, ones that are actually de de degradating the batteries. We'll probably step down to level two, well, we are going to use level two charging, so we'll step them down to level two. So we, we hopefully we, we would see as we got into that, that we wouldn't be degradating the batteries. Again, that time will tell how we're going to move through that. Okay, so that's, that's uh, you know, from the fleet perspective. So I'll now introduce you to Khalil Khalil, and he'll take you through, you know, what else we're looking at beyond EV and how we're going to look at greenhouse gas emissions going forward. So Khalil, the floor is over to you. Thank you so much. And uh, again, thank you guys for uh, giving us this opportunity to present what Pirletri is doing. In reality, we start our uh, electrification journey from 2000. Uh, by testing different type of vehicle, uh, chassis, working with academia, with most, let we say, hydro companies like Hydro Quebec and with their research lab. The intent is to find the best way to, let we say, uh, to electrify our fleet. Uh, there is different ways. We, we, we test, by the way, by converting some uh, fuel trucks uh, into electric, uh, let we say, vehicle by getting from Ford, for example, uh, straight uh, chassis and uh, uh, putting uh, electrical equipment on this chassis. All what you think and you imagine as testing we did, including the uh, low speed vehicle and uh, electrification. Next slide. In my part, I will be mostly focusing on other type of uh, activities we are doing in order to reduce our the GHG, let we say, emission. One of them is not only to look to the technology of the of the of the track, but also the source of energy. In this case, for example, uh, we did a lot of work in the past in biodiesel, and uh, we found that also the biodiesel now had some interest uh, from transportation standpoint. Uh, as you know, biodiesel is not only used for uh, the ground transportation, but also air transportation. Air Canada tests this biodiesel in their the airplane. And it's providing a uh, lot of let's say, results in terms of GHG uh, reduction. And this is exactly why in 2022, we will be exploring again uh, that type of uh, activity in terms of uh, looking for different source of energy. Like, for example, uh, in addition to by fuel, we will be looking to hydrogen, the uh, cell fuel, we'll be looking to, uh, to um, uh, let me say, uh, uh, the compressed gas and all these type of, let we say, uh, source or new source of energies to uh, feed and to fill uh, our, uh, let we say, trucks. But in the same time, in terms of GAG reduction, we want to go furthermore. And there is a technology called Remora. This technology is to uh, ensure what we call carbon capture. You know, the government of Canada is investing millions of millions of dollars and it will be investing especially for with the new announcement for the uh, let we say uh, financial statement of the uh, and the investment program of the, the government of canada for the next years that the folks will be put on direct to air the capture for the carbon capture but for us we are not uh, in that industry for capturing the uh, carbon from air but we can capture the carbon from our exhaust, that means the exhaust of our trucks and one of the technology, as I said to you, to allow us to do that is Romora. Uh, there is normally three main technologies uh, around the world. One from Remora, a startup company in the United States. You have Aramco from Saudi Arabia. And finally, Shell. The intent is to put some device uh, and to connect our exhaust to that device. And that device will capture CO2. CO2 will be liquefied and also uh, it will be, uh, let me say, sold back to some industry like, for example, concrete industry, because CO2, when you, 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 you mash that with, and with the concrete, it will be, uh, you, it increases the solidity of the concrete. It's kind of, uh, let me say, carbon cycle, uh, new carbon cycle of that, uh, of that type of uh, activity. Next, uh, next one, please. Next slide. Okay. Now we look to the source of energy. We look to the way that we can, if we can capture this, the GHG, uh, the CO2, sorry, emission from the system. Now we need to look also uh, in, in, in this way to reduce our GHG. 
to look to the operating model. How this type of technology, and this is exactly what Chris mentioned in his presentation. Yes, we we are looking for 100 electric vehicle, but how to operate this electric vehicle, where to operate, uh, when to operate them even, correct? And this is exactly what we are uh, taking a look to the way that we will be operating in the future, especially in our downtown core area. And one of the activities we will be doing uh, very soon is to develop what we call urban quick stop because in terms of operating we can be uh, operating in stationary location or we can operate in mobile uh, location the intent is what the intent is the fact that our terminals so far when servicing area like ottawa or servicing area like richmond or our, uh, area like montreal they are located away from the cities okay and our fleet Fleet servicing this downtown core area need to move, okay, uh, from uh, their uh, original location to the distribution location, uh, and that stem time and the stem distance is consuming fuel and consuming and producing a GHG in addition to contribute to the congestion of the city. The intent is completely to reverse the model in the sense that these trucks or these delivery trucks or these let we say entities will be located on the downtown core area and we will be servicing them through line hall uh, in terms of freight and they will be operating directly from downtown core area this is exactly one of the purpose to have uh, to collaborate with the city especially in terms of charging station or to create by ourselves our own location the good example is the urban quick stop the urban quick stop is very simple is a 24 uh, container divided in two part of it will be acting as a retail location for us or retail store if you want correct where we will where the customer can go pick up uh, his parcel do some returns uh, also uh, do any type of activity related uh, around pure letter product and service the other half will be used as storage container and as operating, uh, let me say, station for our e-bikes and LSV. This means this container will be located in different type of area of the city. The intent is what is not only to eliminate our fuel trucks from the city, but to service our customer and provide more proximity and more convenience to the customer, especially from retail standpoint, and also for the area where surrounding, uh, this means for the radius of two miles, the surrounding that area will be serviced through green delivery if it's LSB or e-bikes. Can you go to the next slide? We have two models. The 40 is a combination of retail and, uh, let me say, e-cargo bikes, or the 20, which is completely pure uh, e-cargo bikes, and depend of the localization of the on the city, depend of the density, depend of the type of service we can provide to the customer. These two models now in the future, you will see them uh, across uh, main uh, cities in, in Canada. Next uh, slide. Also to reduce GHG, we need to do consolidation. That's mean not only we need to be mobile, but also we need to consolidate our freight consolidation in the sense that the driver instead to do different type of stop to deliver his freight, he will be doing only one stop by using the parcel lockers. And the parcel lockers will be used for consolidation. That means the customer will go to that parcel locker to pick up when the driver instead to visit these customers one by one and increase our CO2 emission of the city, he will do only one stop, deliver on these parcel lockers and uh, service the the the, uh, the customer from these parcel lockers. The parcel locker is part of what we call self-service kiosk. Self-service, let me say, service we are providing to the to the uh, customer uh, through this parcel kiosk or, uh, locker or self-service kiosk. You will see them in, uh, for example, malls. Uh, now we have in some uh, metro station, correct, where you will have this type of kiosk where the customer can have direct direct access to our service and uh, product through these kiosks. Also, during the peak season, we turn some of our truck into, let me say, a restaurant truck, the kind of restaurant truck. But the intent is what is to be again 
uh, more, uh, let me say, uh, near the customer to serve the customer perfectly, but at the same time to keep it to keep the service convenient to the customer. That means the customer will find different type of service for, uh, point across, let we say, any type of uh, city. Next. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. This is what we will be exactly doing in uh, uh, Ottawa. Uh, in Ottawa, we'll be really replicating a little bit, but with more enhancement. Uh, what we did as a model for Montreal and as we did as a model for Vancouver, Ottawa, Ottawa will be in reality the, uh, let me say, the standard model of the way that we'll be acting in the future in cities. Uh, it will be a stationary location uh, located at 512 Bank Street. In that location in the front office, you will have all our retail technology and innovation uh, in terms of servicing the customer. In the back uh, of that, let we say, location, you, you will have a location where we will be operating around uh, six to eight uh, electric vehicle and low speed vehicle. Uh, this will allow us to eliminate from your traffic at least 10 uh, fuel trucks, if you want, correct, and to reduce our CO2 emission. This one normally will open and will have an announcement uh, by uh, Q3. We are expecting to be Q3 2022, and you will see there the the, the right, uh, let me say, future of Pirelletter in terms of a green fleet and green service to the community. Next one. This is exactly how the interior of the front office will uh, looks like. Uh, many many self service that we say solution, uh, parcel locker, or uh, eventually direct customer uh, service. Uh, but this uh, type of unit will work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in order to serve our community in uh, Ottawa. Next. In reality, each, each, let we say, urban distribution center, if you can call them, is urban distribution center, will be servicing a couple of what for us we call that uh, FSA. Uh, FSA is an area of service used normally by uh, Canada Post. And uh, this community, for example, the community surrounding uh, this type of, let we say, uh, unit will be uh, covering at least 2.5 uh, kilometers as a radius of the city and all the deliveries to be made on that area will be only serviced through uh, green, let we say, transportation mode. If it's low speed vehicle, if it's uh, LSV, uh, so sorry, e cargo bike, but also the freight when it will be moved from the uh, origin uh, terminal to this type of location or to any type of other, let we say, satellite, satellite location, will be done through electric vehicle if it's three, five ton electric or what uh, Chris presented as a PNG truck. Next uh, slide. Here there is the next, and we are already processing uh, that one. Now we look to the, uh, and we spend, I think, a lot of uh, time to test our vehicle and we continue testing uh, different type of technology and vehicle. But this year we start also testing an open sky uh, and we create an open sky lab in Stittsville in, in the region of Ottawa, where we regrouped all these technology together and we mimic a kind of new residential delivery network. We redesign it, uh, it again. Uh, the concept is very simple, as I said to you, uh, when we are talking about the e-cargo bike and LSV and also uh, electric vehicle to, vehicle to be located on the city and to be serviced uh, from, let we say, the uh, origin terminal. This is exactly the same concept we are doing in Stittsville. Uh, we install a complete operating, uh, let we say, uh, operation, let we say, from uh, uh, for PND by using mobile terminal transfer. The mobile trans terminal transfer is we took a trailer and we develop a new way of trailer by uh, who can expand itself. It can be converted immediately on what we call for us a dock, in reality on a small terminal, where a vehicle will be connected 
to it, electric vehicle or uh, e cargo bikes or low speed vehicle. And these vehicles will be servicing the surrounding area. That uh, mobile uh, terminal will be serviced through the terminal uh, using uh, our line hall or using 35 ton, eventually electric 35 ton. And by doing that, we will be not only developing new way of delivering to our residential area, but in the same time, uh, trying to do uh, as much as we can or covering as much as we can our delivery from A to Z to, uh, by, by different type of mode of uh, electric vehicle. Next one. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, this is exactly the area of Stittsville. Uh, in reality, we will be, or we are located at 9 uh, Smithland Drive, formerly called 17 because the zoning of the uh, of the city and the surrounding area we will be creating what we call clusters and for each cluster based on the density based on the type of route based on the, of the uh, let we say cycling uh, network and all these components related to the city in the proper to each city we will be uh, delivering by using different type of mode if it's e cargo bike low speed vehicle electric vehicle parcel locker we have now added mobile parcel locker and in the near future we'll be even using some uh, existing let we say capabilities like for example the uh, the uh, storage or self storage uh, let we say uh, business in order to use that self storage as uh, let we say uh, storage uh, area for our e cargo bike and the e cargo bike will be operating from this type of let we say uh, business in order to serve also the surrounding community. This is exactly the way that we are developing in the in the future the, the network. Next one. Next slide. <clears throat> As you see now, after we test the different type of modes, after we look to the uh, type of source of fueling our trucks, correct? Uh, after looking even to uh, uh, capture our uh, CO2 uh, from directly from the source. Uh, now we are redesigning the uh, residential delivery model by integrating all these components together in order to achieve our target, what uh, exactly my colleague uh, Cindy indicated at the beginning of the presentation, to achieve the objective of per letter in terms of CO2 uh, emission, as you know, as you see, sorry, as a combination of mode of vehicle, the uh, operating model, and also, and very important, is the, uh, the, the, the area where we will be, uh, let we say, operating. Because so far, one of the challenges also for electric vehicle, not only the fact that we need to have charging station everywhere, but also we need to change our infrastructure or electric infrastructure in order to allow us exactly to take benefit of this uh, electrification of the fleet, but also from city standpoint is to allow us uh, in terms of zoning to implement this. For example, if I, we, knew we need to implement the urban quick stop from zoning standpoint, there is some limitation and we are uh, working diligently uh, with the city of Ottawa and uh, uh, they're collaborating a lot with us in order to maybe give a chance to review the zoning when, for example, we are using this type of solution, green solution to, uh, to uh, let we say, serve our customer. Again, the solution is not one component. Electrification of the fleet is a combination of all these components, the network, the, the, the location, the regulation, uh, the mindset of people and all their stuff, and this is exactly uh, this picture. This this slide give you, uh, let me say, a good idea of the different type of solution we tested. We are now trying to integrate into, uh, let me say, or simulate in real life uh, their usage in a very particular area, uh, and we are more than glad to test in, in Ottawa. So far, we are we have different mode of uh, let we say uh, stationary or mobile urban distribution center this is exactly what you have from the left to the right uh, after that you have different type of e-bike we test uh, 
most most of the brands you know uh, around the world we tested in, in in Canada. Also, we introduced the low speed vehicle concept. It don't exist in the industry now. We have it in the industry electric vehicle with the effort made by fleet with the five motives in British Columbia, but also with the new 100. Let we say electric vehicle we are looking for uh, for uh, 2022. We introduce also the concept of mobile plug and play parcel capability. Mobile plug and play parcel capability. For example, if we have normally the uh, the parcel locker are mostly stationary, correct? But in case if there is a peak, uh, during especially the peak season, and in case if, for example, you want to uh, better serve especially rural area and uh, this type of, let we say, region surrounding the city, mostly surrounding the, even the city, we can have also mobile parcel locker, and this is exactly what we are uh, trying to do through that uh, seasonal uh, locker. Finally, and this is exactly the uh, what we'll be testing by end of this year and beginning of next year for the area of Stittsville and Ottawa, we will be introducing the concept of follow me, which is exactly uh, a robot following our driver to do uh, delivery, uh, residential delivery, or eventually, and we will be testing in very uh, small area uh, in Ottawa, what we call autonomous delivery is a robot. It's completely uh, automated and uh, autonomous, let we say, solution to deliver our residential, especially our residential area uh, in terms of parcel uh, and service. Voila. Is there any question? No, be shy, no, folks. <laughs> Anybody have general, some, some good? I have a general question. Um, yeah. I know you're launching this in Stittsville. I'm assuming this is because it's closer to, I guess, the tech sector that's in Stittsville. I, I, I don't know why Stittsville is chosen specifically, but if all goes according to plan of how that works, do you see that kind of transferring over to other suburbs or is it more? Um, or like, what, what's the solution for more like inner urban areas? In reality, the solution for more urban areas that depend on the cities because the concern we have with uh, any type of city, it's not uh, particular to Ottawa, is the zoning problem, correct? And why Stittsville? For the simple reason that the piece of land we found in Stittsville, mm -hmm. uh, we, we are allowed to install our uh, mobile sort unit. Mobile sort unit is considered as a warehouse. When you talk about your house to the city, they say to you, no, you cannot do it, put, do, do it anywhere. You need to be in the industrial zone. We are very lucky to, to have a very small piece of land uh, zoned as industrial, surrounded by, let me say, a residential area, which is perfect, let me say, environment for our testing. And it allows us exactly to test. For the urban quick, uh, quick stop and uh, if it's stationary, uh, stationary or mobile, if you want, because there is a solution for mobile urban quick stop, it remains that it depends again uh, of the zoning of the city. And uh, I think cities start now to understand the importance of this type of uh, delivery. And uh, some of them, like so, for example, if I take city of Montreal, they are very open. Uh, they don't have concern about zoning. When, for example, you go to Toronto uh, or eventually Ottawa, but Ottawa, they start also understanding the problem and really, really helping us to, let we say, provide us with area where we can exactly install this type of, uh, let we say, solution across their city. Montreal would like, for example, between uh, three to four, let we say, uh, sites. Uh, equipped with this type of uh, new, let me say, solution. Uh, and the intent is what is uh, to serve as much as they can as area of the city using a uh, green uh, mode of delivery, e-bikes or low speed vehicle, or eventually the uh, electric vehicle. But depend of the zoning in reality, if the zoning will allow us, we can install many, many of these type of solution across any type of city in Canada. So yeah, Mitchell, Mitchell any, any follow-ups to that? Uh, no, it's just very interesting to kind of hear how that 
works. Uh, I know that the city's new official plan probably speaks to a certain level of um, adapting zoning to reflect the changing uh, demographics of delivery as well as warehouses versus retail spaces. So um, I'm assuming it'd be a very interesting time to be in that space as everything starts to change and adapt. Yeah, and and uh, I, I don't want to put Mitchell on the spot here, but Mitchell actually is working for the city. So and and the city, uh, if if you're aware, uh, they have a uh, energy evolution plan, uh, which is looking at pathways to reduce uh, carbon emissions within within the city. So um, I think uh, I don't know Mitchell if if there's anything that you uh, would want to follow on, on, but. Um, There'd be interest, I think, if you talk at the, to the right people at the city to facilitate uh, solutions that would reduce greenhouse gases in the end, right? Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, and and uh, it's, you know, zoning is, is, is a problem in many ways, but as I'm sure Mitchell will, will concur. Uh, but uh, there, I, I, I could confirm that there's some people who are uh, working on, on trying to um, get around um, the bureaucracy to try to make these uh, low carbon solutions a reality. Yeah, exact, exact. And uh, we already had uh, our, we, we got already many, many support and assistance from, especially the team in charge of zoning, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, and they are trying to do all their best to, let we say, overcome. If you mm -hmm. want this type of uh, difficulties, but it remains that uh, we need to review this type of legislation for the simple reason. For example, if we didn't review the legislation for e-cargo bikes and low-speed vehicle uh, by Transport Canada or by provincial, that we say authorities, we will not be talking to you today about this type of vehicle. Correct. The yeah. same thing for autonomous delivery. I know that the government of Ontario is, uh, and we are part of the some consultancy about the, uh, with the government of Ontario regarding the new regulation for autonomous delivery uh, mm -hmm. at the provincial level. There is some area where we are, we are allowed to do some tests, like Ottawa, like uh, Hamilton, for example. Correct, where we are allowed to do the test. Why? Because this is the future. This is exactly how we will reduce our uh, DAT, let we say, uh, gas emission. And uh, if we don't, uh, let we say, try to find different ways to do it, we will not achieve our target at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Greg, you had a yeah. comment or a question? Well, two questions. One, uh, there was a question in chat about sort of the environment, about the PM 2.5s, and that was, uh, and my question was going to be, uh, <clears throat> when I've driven by the site, I have seen vehicles that I thought were gas vehicles, but maybe uh, am I just not realizing? Are, are you, do you have enough electric vehicles at the Stipsville site yet? Or are you still having to use some gas vehicles just because you don't have enough uh, uh, source of the, the, the electrics yet? How, what, what's, how's that coming along so far? In reality, with the Sitzville, we started Sitzville before the plan as exposed by uh, uh, Chris uh, regarding 100 uh, vehicle. We are expecting from these 100 vehicle to have some uh, units for our, let we say, uh, uh, location. Uh, even the five uh, electric vehicle uh, were, were deployed in British Columbia, more not on Ottawa, but for sure that uh, Stitzville location will be a part of the uh, future deployment of electric vehicle uh, uh, operator. The, 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 in terms of electrification, we will be also uh, starting very soon with uh, some e-bikes there mm -hmm. and also low-speed vehicle to serve especially surrounding area, okay, because we are, uh, let me say, uh, limited by this area and for these areas uh, we would like to really uh, test the way that uh, the electric vehicle and uh, low speed vehicle can uh, and we are more than convinced that can better let you say serve uh, the area by the way and uh, even if you are using fuel uh, trucks so far we start with eight routes now we are at seven and from these sevens, we will be almost converting one or two, if it's not three routes, into low-speed vehicle and into e-cargo bikes. Just to give you an idea how we are 
in the minute if you don't have electric vehicle but that's mean what uh, chris uh, indicated uh, in terms of 100 vehicle it remains that there is a way to reduce the number of vehicle by working on the type of let we say residential delivery network you will be uh, putting in place that's mean you will by modifying, and this is exactly the purpose of that exercise, by modifying your operating model, you can really contribute to reduce the GHG and the model uh, proved by, by, by itself, the fact that from the standard eight vehicle we have in the past, not only we eliminate their stamp time because these eight vehicle was moving, were moving from uh, Hawthorne and uh, uh, I think Walt Clay, uh, two seats wheel. That's mean we are talking about 24, uh, let we say 24 to 30 kilometers per day in one way. It means 60 kilometers in the two way. On daily basis, these vehicles are doing the type of movement, which is the stem uh, distance, in order to serve that area. Now these vehicles are sitting there. They are uh, fed, fed by three to five ton trucks. And that truck can be also converted on the electric vehicle. And I think there is the, the one who will be uh, delivering to the uh, 512, uh, let me say, uh, uh, the, the location where we'll be implementing the, uh, the stationary, let me say, uh, retail and slash e-bike uh, location. It will be serviced by, I think, uh, three, five ton electric vehicle. This means at least the feed, not only we are reducing the movement of vehicle from the origin terminal to the uh, to the satellite, but also we are converting and we are looking to convert the mode of transportation into electric vehicle. We hope that uh, with the new deployment of the electric vehicle, all that area will be electrified uh, from A to Z. Okay, in all the concept of the operating motorway. GHGs, as far as like the other park particulates and stuff like that, like gas engines are extremely pollute, uh, polluting, you know, not just GHGs. There's all sorts of different stuff they put out. Do you have any stuff like that that you uh, are able to share or have you, that you're tracking at all? Yeah, exactly. In reality, the you see the Remora, Remora now we are using, uh, we will be testing it into. We call that heavy truck, but uh, Aramco is also developing the same technology and Remora, we will be doing with them some uh, research and development next year in order to extend the type of technology to our fuel trucks. That means we can keep fuel trucks, but we will be uh, acting on their exhaust and reducing our, uh, let me say, our fuel, and our uh, CO2 emission through that type of uh, technology, in addition for electrification, to complement and supplement, if you want, the uh, GT, uh, uh, let you say, reduction. This is the way that uh, we have to look to it. But keep in mind something that even at the international level, and people they are saying that we will eliminate fuel trucks, fuel trucks will not be eliminated until 2050. Okay, this means we will remain with that type of solution. Question is the following. Uh, do we only need to focus on the electrification? Yes, but on the same time, we will to work on the fuel trucks by uh, trying to get better type of fuel because now, uh, let me say, oil company are like Aramco, like Shell, like ESO. They have their research lab working on different type of fuel to reduce their impact into CO2 emission across the world. Why? Because they need to survive. This oil company if tomorrow will eliminate your fuel trucks. <laughs> they need to survive at the end of the day. But based on the experts, the fuel truck will remain with us until 2050, at least. Okay, thanks. So Lutz was asking, and, and actually uh, Chris uh, responded, uh, was asking about uh, EV Everywhere initiative that uh, is being run uh, through Blue Wave AI in Ottawa. Uh, Lutz, you actually work for Blue Wave AI? So if you um, so uh, lots of yeah, I'm just wanna... just turning on my my camera, my mic here. Yeah, this is not really a blue API project. The SDI is always involved. Hydro Ottawa, um, actually, the government of Ontario is invested in that. 
um, it's a, quite a major initiative to uh, essentially look into smart charging infrastructure and software mostly to control um, the power to the different EVs of a fleet in terms of their priorities, their routes, and uh, we're just getting going on that. So we are definitely interested in uh, reaching out to <clears throat> all kinds of fleet operators. So right now our major um, focus is on TTC, the Toronto Transport Commission. So we're working with them on their bus electrification. So, but if you if you are interested in that, or you have if you haven't heard about this, uh, you're welcome to to reach out to me, and I can definitely uh, give you a little bit of an intro into what we are doing. We're essentially we're looking a little bit on the other side. You know, we we want to minimize the electrical upgrades. You know, like to to reduce the cost on the infrastructure, on the depot side of things, on the charging side of things, right? And um, so, essentially, to be smart about delivering the available power to uh, the demand, uh, which can change every day. <laughs> yes. Depending on wind, weather, temperature, load, whatever, right? And um, it's very interesting. So anyway, um, I was looking at your presentation with uh, great interest. Um, um, one thing I really liked, I had never thought about the mobile hubs <laughs> to reduce the, um, essentially to reduce the distance, right, to the customers. I think this is super smart, you know, but this is all about being smart about how we do things, right? And uh, yeah, exactly. the, the charging part is one component of the whole picture. <laughs> in reality, I can share my email yeah. address in the Slack. Yes, and, please. Uh, if you guys yeah. want to follow up, yes, please. Um, be in touch with me, okay? <clears throat> Thank you. And in reality, uh, the fact to work with these hydros company or hydros business will give us the opportunity also to uh, explore different type of, let me say, solutions and technology. You are talking about smart grid. We are talking also eventually uh, long term storage, uh, let me say, uh, energy, which is now uh, start to be really taken seriously by the government of the United States because it will help. And I think I saw one of the question made by uh, some folks regarding uh, the uh, vehicle to grid. The vehicle to grid is in reality uh, based on some study and uh, uh, in reality simulation of the uh, of the city using electric vehicles. These electric vehicle can be the source of energy and source of storage, if you want. Stor yeah, storage, yeah, that's... <laughs> Yeah, yeah that's something. Electric vehicle and the grid in the smart way. Yeah, so so actually, I I have a presentation I'm doing soon. <laughs> We're going to be talking about that with another another organization, and yeah, there's there's a lot of interest, a lot of work being done, and lots. I'm sure you're very much aware of that, right? On the implications of vehicle to grid and and smart charging and all that, and how could we use that to reduce the. Uh, <laughs> The dependence on on uh, gas fired electricity and um, sh uh, peak shaving and all that kind of stuff. So very very interesting uh, developments in that area. So um, we're we're going to try to to uh, I think there's uh, Mitchell has another question or another comment. And I think there's another person after that. Yeah, I don't want to keep you guys for too long. So, <laughs> but very interesting conversation. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, my, my quick question was whether or not there was anything that you thought uh, municipalities could help you with this outside of zoning, uh, whether it's providing a certain level of public infrastructure or working together on infrastructure deployments or facilitating that permitting process to get charging stations deployed. I don't know if any of that is something that you'd be looking at or looking for support on. In reality, yes. And in reality, your city already anticipate the, uh, the that we say, uh, their involvement. Uh, from the first day, we are talking about electric vehicle and uh, uh, putting in place some, uh, let me say, uh, area where we will be operating our, uh, especially our e-cargo bike. Uh, mm -hmm. Different type of department inside, uh, let me say, uh, Ottawa provided all their support and all their help. Uh, so far, what is remaining just the zoning, correct? We are, and I think there is some... Uh, uh, let me say, intent to review the zoning in some area. 
uh, in order for us to to allow us exactly uh, to move, especially uh, the mobile sort you need. We call that mobile for the simple reason that uh, it need to be to move uh, during the day. That's mean we have we we select some area, for example, uh, the Canada Canadian can entire I think center. The OK, all the parking because the concept is what the concept is. Uh, to use this uh, space, empty space during the night, and uh, uh, most of these parking space are empty from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. To use this empty space to, to uh, let me say, to install this mobile uh, sort unit. Mobile sort unit, as I said to you, is a mini dock for 10 routes uh, to keep these routes again not moving across on the city, but to go to this parking lot empty during the night. To be serviced because when people uh, sleep, we as Pure Letter, we work. Our, our freight is sorted in the local level during the night. And it's, it's overnight process. We pick up from your door in the morning or in the afternoon, mostly in the afternoon. After that, we go to our sortation process locally. After that, to national sortation process, to the destination sortation process. But all that process, what we call that middle mile, is done during the night. During the night, these parking lots are uh, are empty, and we can use them and use them in order to do oper our uh, operation by uh, adopting the concept of mobile sort unit. That means the mobile sort unit. I will invite all of you, please, to pay a visit to our Stittsville location. Uh, the mobile sort unit, as I said to you, is uh, uh, is a uh, 42 feet uh, trailer. But the 42 feet is expandable. It's five doors in each side, and uh, it can be uh, moved from one area to another area on daily basis. That means every day we can move it from, for example, it can operate in the morning in the, in Canada. After that, you go to Stittsville in the afternoon or during the night, for example, it can be located in any type of uh, shopping center, parking station, or uh, like an entire, uh, let me say, uh, hockey game space where we can operate uh, this type of thing. The most important thing is to adopt what we called, and I will conclude on that with your permission, to adopt what we call the distributed model. So far as Courier Express Company, we are using what we call Hoban Spoke model. Hoban Spoke model, it's uh, in terms of CO2 emission, is very, very productive. As, uh, producing CO2 emission. Why? Because as I said, give you as, as an example, your terminal, two letter terminals located in Hawthorne, were in the east of the city, one is delivering or servicing the west of the city. Okay. The distributed model, you have small terminals across the city, and these small terminals are just servicing their area. This is what you saw in that residential delivery model with a cluster, small cluster, and these clusters are uh, uh, services by using very small, let we say, vehicle like e cargo bikes and low speed vehicle. You will see this model now developed in Europe, and this is exactly what you will see in Paris, in Hamburg, in London. They are adopting this model. We call that distributed model from network, let we say, uh, design standpoint. Very, very interesting. So the last question, I guess, will be for uh, for Art Hunter. Art, uh, Art is a very interesting character. Lots of very long experience in the energy uh, side of things. So, Art, your question. Yeah, it's um, more of a comment. I'm. I want to congratulate you folks at putting together such an excellent um, uh, presentation. And uh, I can just see the enthusiasm that is is oozing out of you two. It's um, it really is amazing, and uh, I, I would like to personally applaud you on on putting this forward. Um, I'm also interested in possibly um, having you back in a year to see how things have gone, can conditions have changed, and uh, how fast you've managed to to adjust to those um, changing conditions. I mean, you, you've got a big system there with lots of moving parts and and uh, just how all that's gonna perform. Uh, I'm, I'm just really interested in that. Thank you, and you are more than welcome, welcome to join us on that part. We're, we're really interested to see it too. So that's uh, yeah. a play out.
Yeah, it does seem like a very, very interesting time to be a peer leader to see all these developments. So, uh, so in, on that note, uh, thank you very much, uh, both uh, well, Cindy, Chris, and uh, Khalil, for for your most excellent presentation. And uh, we are we are thrilled that you were able to come and present to us today. Uh, so, on behalf of the Electric Vehicle Council of Ottawa, I thank you very much for for coming over. And uh, you are more than welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, uh, but that's that's your choice. Uh, we're gonna we have a regular agenda that we're gonna go through. So, um, and we're gonna try to um, we're gonna get, try to get through everything uh, that we have on the agenda today. So, thank you again very much, and uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll go to the next presenter. So, um, we will definitely, I think, agree with them that uh, you have to come back. Uh, I would say even sooner than a uh, than a year's time. I, I would say I'd want to hear from you uh, in the fall. I but that that's between Raymond and everybody else and what your what your availability is like. But we would love to have you back. Yeah, so thank yeah. You very much. Yeah, we, we, we we're very I'm very cognizant that this is taking uh, your time and all that. So very appreciative of that and uh, would would very much like to get a follow up presentation some point in the future to see how things are going. And again, if there are some issues uh, that um, uh, that you're, you're you're having some some difficulties with um, uh, the city in particular, um, uh, Mitchell's not the only one who has contacts at the city, so uh, so we may be able to uh, help push some things through for you uh, to try to help uh, with uh, you know making these projects uh, easier on you. So um, so we'd be um, you know we're we're an organization that's there to uh, really our mission is to electrify the transportation system to reduce greenhouse gases, right? So everything we could do in that uh, direction is uh, is positive for us. Okay. Let so us know how we can help them in the future again. too. Yeah. yeah. Great. So on to the next topic. So thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. So um so uh, brief update on the EV experience. So um, we are making some progress and you can see here, this is a picture uh, on the screen of our trailer that we got wrapped a few weeks back. And uh, it turned out that we, uh, the guy who did the job is a guy out of Gatineau that uh, uh, Sam, one of our directors uh, referred us to and he did a really good job uh, on the, uh, the wrap. So we're very happy with it. This is in front of the, um, Ministry of Coffee, uh, I think it was, uh, that on Wellington Street, where we had one of the uh, uh, cars and coffees a few weeks back. Um, so uh, that's that with that stuff. So we're going to get, uh, we don't have, I think I have it here. Yeah, we're still waiting for the tent and the apparel to come in. It's still not um, available yet, uh, but we expect to get that soon. So uh, hopefully we'll we'll have that in the next few weeks for the, um, uh, the events that we have planned. So uh, in terms of uh, technical training, so uh, I had said originally that the technical training would be in April. Uh, we uh, we're going to be doing it in May for the uh, for you guys and gals. Um, so and like I said before, this is going to be review for people. It's a question of being uh, having a level set so that you have some idea of uh, when you get questions that maybe you wouldn't have had in the past that you could uh, understand. Oh, there's Sam. He just. Uh, just arrived. So, um, so Sam, Sam just arrived as I was talking about him in good, but anyways, um, so, um, so we'll do that in May. Uh, the deck is all prepared. We used it today, actually. So we did the EnviroCenter uh, technical training today. So Mike and I went on a trip with our friends at EnviroCenter and uh, do, did our best to uh, bring you up to date on uh, everything uh, possible about EV so that they're ready to, um, participate in the events that we have. Okay, so we'll have the signups uh, soon on the web. Uh, we did our dry run in Kepville. Uh, several of you, um, I see Lutz there, Lutz was there, uh, Craig, uh, a bunch of others were there. Uh, there were seven, of, seven cars uh, and uh, it went quite well. We had a booking tool that we tried uh, for the first time and a survey we tried for the first time. So uh, for those who haven't provided feedback yet and were there, if you have some feedback, we'd be more than interested in getting it. Uh, we did get feedback from a few sources already and we'll be acting on it. So we do know the survey 
uh, needs a, a bit of adjustment. It's a bit long and, and, and a few things are a bit clunky, so we'll fix that. Uh, the booking tool, there's a few things also we want to uh, fix there and, uh, and, and other related things. So one of the suggestions was that we should have a display that shows what, which appointments are available, right? Really good idea. It's just we will work on that. We'll need a TV for that though, but we'll work on that and um, hopefully have that ready uh, fairly soon. Uh, and like I said, we're still waiting for the tent and the apparel. So I um, just want to show the next screen here. Oops. Okay. So these are pictures from uh, the technical training today. So these are the our technical, uh, the, the ambassadors for, from Envira Center. Uh, we did a trip that went from um, uh, with the two cars, we went from Tunney's Pasture uh, to Camp Phil, then went to Cornwall and back through St. Albert. And we stopped in front of a windmill. That's where we took the picture there. So that's the um, uh, one of the windmills over there. Uh, that uh, that, uh, that one was actually under maintenance right now. So it wasn't spinning, but the other ones were. And uh, you could see there that there's a charging session that uh, a real charging session that um, uh, Mike did with his car. So we stopped also at a supercharger, a Tesla supercharger to show them how that works and all that. So uh, I think it went quite well. And I think it was very valuable uh, to go over that because um, the, uh, the that group of uh, four people are people who are less familiar with with cars in general. And uh, so it was, uh, and certainly with EVs, none of them uh, have an EV. Uh, so giving them an experience for um, to to show them what EVs are like was was very very valuable. Okay, so that's where we are with that. So uh, next is uh, Mike with uh, with the news. So mm -hmm. Mike. Yes. All right. So I'll do the news quickly because uh, we're going a bit long. Uh, VinFast revealed pricing. If you remember, VinFast is the Vietnamese company uh, that is entering the North American market. And uh, they're coming up with two cars, the VF8 and the VF9. What's pictured is the VF9. It's a three-row SUV. Uh, pricing starts at 51 for the VF8 and 69 or call it 70 for the VF9. Unfortunately, the prices do not include the battery pack. Uh, which will be a monthly lease. And as yet, they've announced pricing, which seems a little weird, but um, the flexible plan is for $35 a month and you get for the VF8 and 44 a month for the VF9, you get 500 kilometers, uh, which isn't a huge amount. And then there's the fixed plan, which is a no limits, no kilometer limit. Um, but that's 110 bucks a month for the VF8 and 160 for the VF9. So i uh, not sure how that's going to fly in our market of everything's a subscription now, but there you go. Next slide, please. Uh, Canoe wins the contract for the NASA Artemis Astrovans. Uh, so if you're a nerd like me, you've been paying attention to the space race that's currently going on to go back to the moon. Uh, that is called Artemis. It is the sister of Apollo. And... Uh, is they're going back to the moon very soon. Uh, SpaceX has a contract to land on the moon, and Canoe now has a contract for the new Astro Vans, um, which if you watch, you know, the 1960s Apollo missions, you'll see those silver uh, Winnebago type things. Those are uh, Airstream, uh, you know, uh, mobile home kind of things uh, that they would shuttle the, shuttle, pun intended, uh, the astronauts from the the building where they get all suited up out to the pad um so canoe makes an all-electric well canoe doesn't make anything currently but they've won the contract for an all-electric uh van thing that uh a little different than what spacex does spacex uses uh the model x and uh they don't have the same requirements so canoe uh won the contract because their vehicles can seat at least eight people which is what nasa specified as a minimum requirement uh, so presumably a bunch of astronauts plus some support pe personnel. Um, but anyway, that's an artist rendering of what it'll look like. I think it looks pretty cool, and I hope Canoe actually can get to production. Uh, they've got a few prototypes wandering around, uh, but as we all know from Tesla's experience and others, uh, prototypes are one thing, but production, serial production is another. Uh, but they are supposed to have these delivered by June of next year, so they've got one year to come up with this uh, because NASA is in a hurry to get back to the moon. And uh, they're aiming for 2025 to get back to the moon. So they will be doing Artemis 1 this year. If you're really keen on that, it's going to be cool. They just rolled the uh, rocket out to the pad. It had some issues because Boeing's built it. 
and uh, they're rolling it back to the vehicle assembly building to fix the issues and hopefully they'll roll it back out and launch it sometime later this year uh so yeah delays but whatever anyway next slide please uh vw is going to upgrade the meb platform uh the range is currently around 500 kilometers ish i'm not sure exactly which like how much the range is for the id4 uh, but it's in that ballpark they're going to up it to 700 kilometers uh, they're going to up the power so the the charging speeds will inc will go up from 125 kilowatts up to 200 so that'll be a significant increase uh, for people who buy the id4 probably next year i wouldn't say this year we'll get it um, and with that, they'll have a slightly more powerful motors, so it'll increase the acceleration uh, to 5.5, because I guess the ID4 doesn't compete well with my Ionic 5, and Volkswagen's a little jealous, so they're going to try and try and match it at least, because, uh, yeah, my car's better. Anyway, next slide, please. No, no, uh, my car's better. Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Kia has revealed the 2023 Nero EV. Um, from the sound of it, it looks like Communato might be in, end up getting these guys, uh, this vehicle with its interesting styling. Um, it's supposed to start production very soon and uh, delivery start in the fall as a 2023 model year. Um, so they've got that weird contrasting C pillar. Not sure how I feel about it. It looks kind of like I feel like it should be painted like an airliner with like a logo or something, maybe. I don't know. Uh, the range is to increase from the current version up to 407 kilometers from the, I don't know what the current version does, but obviously it's less than 400. Um, it, the interior is going to look a lot more like the EV6. Um, so it'll share a lot of the same dash and screens and the user interface is identical. And the steering wheel, I think, is even identical. So there's going to be a lot of features from the, uh, the EV6 that will make their way into the cheaper model, which is the Nero EV. It's still based on a gasoline platform, so it's not going to be on the eGMP platform that uh, the EV6 and the Ionic 5 are built on, but they're going to steal some of the uh, the coolness from the eGMP, uh, like vehicle to load. So the Nero EV, the new one, will be able to use the same adapter as the EV6 and the Ionic 5. And as I said earlier, deliveries are expected this fall, so hopefully Communato gets them soon probably not Do you know if they're no. all-wheel drive uh, available in the electric yet or no uh it's, it's that's a platform limitation so they'll be front wheel drive just like the current ones um the, because the the way the platform was built uh toyota revealed pricing for the bz4x and i'm going to call it bz4x because we're canadian damn it and that's just how that rolls okay so take that toyota um they've aggressively priced it though so Credit to where it's due. Um, they they priced it under 45 to meet the ISEV rebate, which um, has now been moved up to 55,000. So we'll see how long the $45,000 L model lasts. I'm not expecting it to last much past next week, but we'll see. The LE is going to be $50,000 and adds a bunch of safety features and paint because apparently safety is optional. Uh, the XLE will be 54,990, and that adds all-wheel drive, which is cool. Um, so Subaru hasn't announced the Solterra pricing yet, but you can expect it to be around 55, given that this version is basically the exact same vehicle. So 55,000 seems reasonable for both vehicles. Uh, the top of the line will be the XLE, and they've done the same thing as all the other <laughs> automakers to keep the ISEV credit uh, valid. So they um call it the xle package and they add a package on top so the technology so it's the xle's trim and then they add the technology package bumps the price up but you get a bunch of cool features um and all of them currently qualify for the isev and will have anyway now because the isev has moved the goalposts next slide please all right and this is this is fun this is cool so a few days ago like literally three days ago uh, Stackhan completed the data year for 2021 for the uh, new vehicle registration data. And uh, so I took those final numbers from Stackhan and I plugged it into my handy dandy little model here. You, you can see that on the top right there. Um, and so that's my uh, prediction algorithm. It's not an algorithm, it's a formula, but whatever. It's my prediction formula that I created in 2017, stealing things from the internet and plugged in a bunch of real world data back in 2017 and then got it to predict the future growth curve for uh, EVs in Canada, plug-in vehicles really, so it's PHEVs and battery electric because they both plug in, it's fine. 
Um, and as you can see, uh, I don't know if you can see on your screens if it's too small, but the, the blue line is the real data and the red line is the predicted data. And uh, the blue line has been a little bit higher than the red line, uh, except for 2020, of course, because we had the pandemic and that we lost an entire quarter of sales. But uh, so far, so good. The model is holding. Um, we are on track to continue growth. Uh, the model is currently projecting a 7.32% market share this year. And I expect we'll achieve that, if not beat it. Uh, I deliberately crippled the model a little bit to make it a bit more conservative because it's... <laughs> I mean, people didn't believe my numbers anyway, <laughs> and so this way, you know, I'm I'm probably going to be right. Um, at least I'll be wrong, but in a good way. It'll be under underestimating the actual values, hopefully. Um, so things are looking good for EVs. Um, essentially, we can say that one in twenty cars right now is an EV. Uh, by the end of next year, it'll be uh, one in ten. And uh, not long after that, every couple of years, it doubles, it seems. So it'll be one in five and then every second car and then, you know, game over for gas cars in a few years, uh, which is kind of what we want. Right. So there you go. These are the numbers. Uh, I'll keep you guys up to date every time StackN gives me more data and uh, we'll go from there. Next slide, please. All right. Uh, so if you've ordered a Tesla and you're hoping to count on the uh, mobile connector, uh, you can't because they're going to remove it. It's already apparently not part of the delivery package on new vehicles. So it's a $400 add-on, which is currently out of stock. So even if you want one, you can't order one. Um, so not only does your Tesla cost, your Model Y cost more than my Ionic 5 by 20 grand, but they don't even throw in the level one charger. So there, Raymond, just joking. I'm just teasing. All right. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Giga Shanghai has restarted production. So you might not have heard, but uh, China has a uh, zero COVID policy, which means basically they just lock down the whole city if there's any COVID, uh, which is kind of absurd at this point. But whatever. That's what they were wanting to do. So they shut down Shanghai <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. And the factory went offline because, you know, nobody's allowed to leave their house kind of thing. Um, but Tesla has worked out a way where they can have 8,000 workers uh, live at the factory, which sounds so fun. And uh, they'll get a $65 a day stipend for food. Uh, they have cots and dormitory uh, areas set up for them. And uh, they're going to ramp production slowly apparently uh, probably because everyone will be miserable sleeping at the factory and uh, <laughs> they're they're hoping to get back up and running uh, building model wise in, in giga shanghai uh, they've already missed 40,000 units um, so that's how much the hit of covid has taken since march uh, they're they're down 40,000 units so far and counting so they need to get back up and running as soon as they can or else it's really going to hurt um, so yeah um, support your unions? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the Mega Pack uh, in California, so the Pacific Gas and Electric PG&E, uh, they've just activated, they've just turned it on, the new Mega Pack in Moss Landing in California. It is 730 megawatt hours currently and is fully operational, helping out the grid. Uh, it's 256 Mega Packs. Those are those big white boxes you see. Um, which are bigger than gigapacks. Uh, these are the, the bigger ones on um, 33 concrete slabs. And they will eventually scale it up to 1.1 gigawatts or gigawatts if you're Doc Brown, um, which will be one of the largest grid storage installations in the world. Next slide, please. Giga Berlin is up and running, which is great. They are doing 350 Model Ys per week currently. They're aiming to ramp to 1,000 a week, um, which, if you're good at math, unlike me, uh, will be an annualized rate of around 50,000 Model Ys because, you know, there's 52 weeks in a year. So there you go. Um, they're not there yet, but they're working towards it, and I expect them to get there because they're very good at building cars in Germany, it turns out. Um, and that's not the final production capacity goal. They're actually aiming a lot higher than that, but uh, let's hope that they, they get there. 1,000 vehicles a week. They're building model-wise exclusively for the moment. Um, and Germany and Europe um, are very eager to get model-wise because they haven't had access to them yet. So there you go. Go Berlin. 
Back to you, Raymond. Thanks a lot, Mike. <laughs> you missed one of the big events. Uh, the, the Twitter agreed to, to be sold to Musk. I mean, I know it's technically not EV, but I would say that would be a big event that uh, Musk is officially buying Twitter. Yeah, but that that's not EV related. Yeah, but anyways, that's another that's, whole other discussion that we'll have in front of beer. Nothing sometime. to do with anything. Yeah. Well, Tesla <laughs> stock went down in Craig's demand. Yeah. yeah. Meh. Well. Anyways, so uh, let's let's try to get through this because we are we are running pretty late on time. So um, just go. I'll go through the past uh, event. So green drinks for those who uh, did not attend. It's available as a recording, and uh, it was quite interesting to hear what they had to talk about. Uh, these guys are working on uh, mass timber buildings, and uh, as we've discussed before, the advantage of mass timber is that you are sequestering carbon into the the the, um, the 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 frame or the structure of the building whereas if you're building with steel or concrete uh, the production process for steel and concrete emits lot, lots of ghg so um, using mass timber instead so instead of emitting ghgs you're actually sequestering gsgs ghgs in your your structure so uh, very interesting uh, progress being made in that space. So again, if you want to listen to it, it's been uh, recorded. Uh, <clears throat> cars and coffee. So we had three cars and coffee. I've got the April 30th one, which is this weekend on this list because it's the April list. Uh, but you see two pictures there of uh, the ones that I was able to attend. I couldn't attend the first one because I had something else. Uh, but uh, it worked out well. We had uh, uh, the last one in particular, we probably had like 20 people, I think, right? Um, uh, Mike? Uh, yeah, no, at least, uh, we had a, yeah, a couple dozen. Yeah. Uh, Terry, and, uh, you have a question? Good. Terry? Yeah, yes. Um, and just, uh, on the green drinks, mm -hmm. I've had a, a lot of problems trying to find the videos of their past meetings and, uh, they sent me a link once. Uh -huh. And it worked, but um, if you do a search, it doesn't seem to be an easy find. Uh, is uh, it possible for you to put it on our, our website? Uh, I I'll could, see what I can do. Yeah, yeah. They're, they have a uh, YouTube channel like we have. And uh, with YouTube, if you're not, um, if you don't have lots of subscribers, so hint, hint, if you're not a subscriber, you should subscribe to our channel. But uh, if you're not a, a, a uh, if you don't have lots of subscribers and lots of views, uh, you tend to not show up in the search mm -hmm. results, right? Uh, but uh, the recording should be there. And uh, there's a standard format that he uses for uh, everything that I think all he also uses for the recordings. I'm not absolutely sure, uh, but certainly we'll get that for you and uh, we'll pass it around. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So, um, so um, I need to take notes while I'm. I'm hey, you didn't that. put in the May cars and coffee, Raymond. No, th th that's future event. Oh, okay. Sorry, Jeez. sorry. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I just should so, point out, though, there is a Cars and Coffee this Saturday. It'll be at in the Glebe at Little Victory's Coffee Shop. And there is a parking garage, a city parking garage on 3rd Avenue just across the street. Um, so that we can probably just collect there. There's a couple of chargers. So if you have a ghetto leaf like I will have this week, uh, I will be able to charge there. So uh, see you all there. You should okay. maybe add that to the Facebook event. I maybe should, and probably will right now. Okay, cool. The uh, parking garage is actually on 2nd Avenue, not 3rd Avenue, but that's a small detail. Close enough. Whatever. <laughs> anyway, so other... Sure, but... <laughs> Sorry, uh, other past stuff to to talk about. So this is was an official an official uh, event that we had, but on April thirteenth, uh, there was a motion uh, that passed council uh, that was uh, sponsored by Councillor Dudas and and Menal that had to do with uh, charging in the high performance development standard. So um, the high performance development standard is a, uh, a set of standards that are being implemented by the city to uh, to mandate uh, tougher, um, tougher uh, standards for things like energy efficiency. Uh, there's a lot of other things that are environmentally related, but they're um, they're not they're not greenhouse gas per se. So there's drainage stuff. There's stuff about the 
the the the the uh, the tree canopy and a bunch of other things like that in the standard there is a section on charging infrastructure and uh so i intervened with councillor duras and and um uh, mostly with councillor duras and back with some of the uh, the staff at City Hall uh, to remove the option for new builds uh, to put level one charging. Uh, and, you know, if you want to, if we could talk on the round table, if you, if you want to, about why that was important. So what they'll be able to do right now is uh, they'll be compelled to do a level two charging uh, in every parking spot that's not a visitor parking spot for developments that to which this thing applies. Okay, so this the HPDS does not apply to all new properties, but it applies to a, a significant portion of new properties uh, starting in 2024, I believe. Uh, Mitchell could correct me if I'm wrong there. The uh, other part. It's yeah. Um, or yeah, 25. So anything that goes. It's basically the next term of council if you just want to simplify things. Yeah. Okay. So um, the other part was that there was some discussion or some some wording in the standard that talked about metering and uh, my my uh, intervention there was to make sure uh, that it didn't require um, utility uh, utility um, grade metering uh, because utility grade metering has a bunch of implications and is costly so it would probably add uh, over two thousand dollars per potentially add over two thousand dollars per parking spot in extra costs so uh, so the idea was to uh, permit the use of software metering instead and as uh, as i'm sure you all know uh, cars will meter how much electricity is being used and uh, most charging stations will be able to report on that so uh, the idea is to use the charging infrastructure to uh, report on that instead of having uh, utility grade meters like you have on the side of your home okay so April 19th, I did a presentation for Earth Day uh, in French, and uh, we've got the recording, so uh, we're going to uh, try to put it on our YouTube channel. Uh, Mike, I just put it in the folder there today. Um, cool. It's the only thing we have in French at this point, so uh, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to put it onto our YouTube channel. Um, Mike is doing the same presentation in English tomorrow. Uh, I'm at a hockey game tomorrow, so I'm not available. So Mike is a lucky guy who is uh, going to be presenting in English. Not quite uh, the same presentation. I made it prettier. Yeah, his <laughs> presentation is much prettier. Uh, the content is is uh, essentially the same, uh, but Mike is much better at making fancy graphs. So uh, as you saw during the news, uh, he's pretty good at that. So it looks much better. But uh, mine sounds better. So mine sounds better. Yeah, but Anyways, I'm Mac. So <laughs> that doesn't make any difference. Anyways, so uh, on April 23rd, so last Saturday, we did the Kempville Sustainability Fair. And um, these are the results. We had uh, four, five different models there. Uh, and the number, you see the number of test drives. So Mike wins the prize for the most uh, test drives uh, with seven. Uh, what do I and, win? Uh, what do I win? <laughs> nothing? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, you win bragging rights. Um, so these are the results of so 21 uh, test drives. Excuse me, and three. And actually, uh, Craig was telling me I'm missing one uh, ride. Uh, so it's probably three uh, rides and uh, and the Model Y and one in the Chevy Bolt for a total of four. Um, so that gives you an idea of uh, you know when we we have a commitment with the EV experience to do 800. Uh, test drives this year. This gives you an idea of the scale of the um, the challenge that um, that we have with that, right? So, uh, that being said, we're working on on plans to to achieve that, and uh, we're yeah we're going to do our best with Envira Center to get there. So, anyways, very successful event. Uh, it was uh, lots of fun. Um, lots of lots of people that um, that I've seen before uh, came over and talked to us and all that so it was a very very uh, pleasant experience so upcoming events uh, so uh, green drinks uh, the people here uh, two of them in particular so Angela and Marion uh, they were uh, working uh, with me in the background on the uh, the motion for uh, city council and they actually uh, they work with Councillor Menard on another motion that also uh, strengthened the uh, the provisions of the HTPS. Uh, 
HPDS. Um, so they will be talking about um, um, all sorts of stuff environmental uh, related. Uh, and so it should be an interesting presentation on the, um, the 12th of May. Okay, and if you want to uh, register, you could find them on um, what's that uh, system again that they use for registration? Uh, it escapes my mind right now, but Eventbrite. Eventbrite, yes, you can find them on Eventbrite, or if you go to bit.ly slash gd may 2022, you will be able to register there. Okay, it's uh, free as usual. And if you get there early, you get the pleasure of going through an interesting quiz. So uh, get a quiz every time. It's pretty cool. Um, so our next monthly meeting, uh, good news, we're back to in-person meetings. So we will have also a virtual option. Uh, but we will have in-person meetings. So we've uh, reached out to the museums and unfortunately our super fantastic deal that we had before where we paid nothing for the museum is no longer available. So uh, what we've done is uh, for the moment and uh, we'll see how this works out. Uh, we're going to go to the Institut Canadien Français and this is a picture of what it looks like uh, from York Street. So it's the corner of Dalhousie and York Street. The, the door, the entrance is on this side. You could buzz to get in. The entrance is on Dalhousie, which is on, on that side there, okay? So uh, you're all welcome to come over in person. If you uh, don't feel comfortable because of COVID or you can't make it for whatever reason, we'll have also a Teams uh, link that you could uh, you could use to uh, to uh, to get to the meeting. Okay, I say entrance at rear here, that's wrong. That's before I talked to Sam earlier today. The entrance is actually at 316 Dalhousie on the side here, uh, on the other side of the building. Okay. Sam has his hand up. Sam has his hand up. Yes, Sam? Uh, for wheelchair accessibility, there is an elevator, or if somebody can't do stairs for a reason, there's no problem, there is an elevator. Uh, when you buzz, uh, just uh, ask for Sam and I'll come and show you the way. Yeah, okay. And oh, and the important thing, and LA, I think you're going to love this one because LA has been asking for this for ages. There will be refreshments available. So there is a bar there. Of course, it's at your expense, uh, but uh, there, there will be a bar and uh, there will be refreshments available until the bar is going to close at nine, I believe. I uh, can't remember exactly, uh, but uh, right, Nine, Sam? 9.30, 10. 9.30 or 10? 10. Okay, yeah. so, uh, but it will be available. Uh, so, and uh, it might be an opportunity for you to, uh, if you haven't been out to a restaurant lately, it's a good time to go and encourage uh, local business and uh, spend a bit of money in their, their premises. But, uh, of course, that's up to you. There is free parking on street after 5.30, so parking is not an issue. Okay. Uh, it's also um, essentially half a block away from the, uh, or well, actually one one block one way and a half block the other way from the train station. So it's uh, very accessible uh, for anybody who. Uh, LRT wants. station, Raymond. Yes, <laughs> LRT difference. station. It's a train, right? It's a train? No? No, it's a tram. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, so it's close to the LRT station. Uh, so if, if anybody wants to take public transit, which uh, would certainly uh, be good, uh, you're most welcome to do that. Okay. So cars and coffee, uh, Mike mentioned it a bit earlier that there were some in, in May. Uh, we, we may adjust this if we uh, have conflicts with other uh, things that we want to do in May. Uh, we're still struggling to uh, firm up some dates for uh, for events. You'll see on the next page, I'm going to talk about everything we have in, uh, in planning right now. Uh, but uh, Mike has just put on Facebook an event for each one of these uh, each one of these uh, here, you've got them until at least June, I believe, right? Um, uh, exactly. Well, I have the whole the whole summer's mapped out to like October, but yeah, yeah, yeah but it's on, super on, flexible. On Facebook, I've only gone up to June and actually had to June, cancel yeah. one because it conflicts with an event already. So yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Okay, so so we're gonna keep on doing those. Uh, we're gonna we're going to. Um, uh, synchronize those with the Tuesday night events, which we don't have any booked at this point, the Tuesday night events. But if you look at the overall schedule, it's starting to 
to get a bit a bit full. Okay, so uh, tomorrow night there's uh, Mike presenting for the Earth Day um, evening event. Uh, there's, I believe, there's over 200 people registered for that, so it should be it should be pretty good. Um, yeah, so so you'll have to have your good voice, uh, Mike. Um, I'll put anyway, on my fancy lighting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, the Canadian Tulip Festival, uh, to be confirmed, okay, so we were thinking we would be uh, participating in that with CAA, uh, but they are not participating uh, from what they uh, indicated to me earlier today. Uh, but uh, we would still like to have some kind of presence there. So we'll keep you posted on that because that's before the next meeting, right? So May 19th, we have the MIFO event that's during the day on a Thursday. Uh, so there's two of us doing test drives. Uh, if anybody else would like to join us, we'd be more than happy to um, to accommodate you. Uh, so this is a uh, an event at the MIFO where uh, it's a um, it's for people who are retired and in, environmentally focused. So I'm doing two presentations at the event. One is on climate change and one is on um, on EVs. OK, and um, we'll be running test drives uh, throughout the day. OK, so uh, May 26th, 28th, uh, Tamarack uh, Ottawa Race Weekend. Uh, we are uh, we got uh, some <coughs> communication about participating in that, but we haven't firmed up the details yet. So again, I'll have to get back to you on that if we uh, will be participating. The actual races, I believe, are all on the Sunday, the 29th. So the 26th would be Thursday evening and uh, probably Friday during the day and then Saturday uh, during the day, okay? And uh, the hope there is we'd be able to uh, run some test drives also, okay? So the Tuesdays I mentioned... On the 27th as well, uh, Raymond, I'm, in, I'm, I'm signed up for a race on the 27th. The big uh, marathon is on the 28th. That's, okay. that's the, the, the premier marathon, but there are, like, there's 5, 10... And, and things like that that are on the 27th. 28th, 28th probably on the Saturday, right? Yeah, the sa Saturday. Yes. Okay, so that's the 28th. So so maybe that's we the, can't do anything. Maybe we can't do test drives on the 28th. We may be able to still talk to people and, and sign them up for uh, future uh, test drives or something. Uh, so we'll we'll try to figure out what we're we're doing there, and we'll uh, we'll call out, call out for volunteers uh, for that. Okay. So every Tuesday night, we would like to start May 17th, but uh, it's not sure whether Enviro Center will be ready uh, by that time. So uh, again, we'll have to keep you posted. Sorry about the last minute uh, stuff, but uh, we're struggling a bit getting and getting things uh, moving fast uh, at this point. So. Um, so one thing we just confirmed today, and I don't know if Lynn is on uh, on the call, so she was on earlier, uh, but the Blackburn Fun Fair is occurring from June 3rd to June 5th, and we just met with the organizer today, and we'll have a, a nice location we could use, and we'll be able to do uh, test drives for part of the uh, the event. So what I'm proposing the uh, June 3rd is the Friday, what we would do there is have the trailer and that kind of stuff in place, talk to the public, book test drives for the two following days, and then do test drives the two following days. Now, the Saturday, there is a, a parade in the morning, so we would we would, uh, we will be uh, participating in the parade, uh, but doing test drives at the end of the parade uh, afterwards, okay? So Aviation Museum, I haven't heard from them. I need to follow up with them to see if they're going to do something on July 1st uh, this year again. Uh, so that one's uh, unsure. July 31st is Auto Motion 2022 in Brockville. That is confirmed. The the date is confirmed, uh, we, and we have a uh, one of our uh, our friends Gord uh, in in uh, Brockville. Uh, well, he's not in Brockville per se, but closer Brockville is going to work with us to uh, coordinate that event. Okay, so you'll hear more about that in the coming uh, months. Uh, we're also looking and participating at the Navin Fair, not confirmed yet. Same thing with the Capital Auto Capital Fair um, in at Rideau Carlton Raceway. Not sure yet. There's a Brockville Fun Day that we'd like to participate in, but we'll see uh, whether we could uh, wing it, given that there's a Capital Fair at the same time. 
There's a National Capital Auto Show that's going to be around September 10th. Uh, we don't have an official date for it yet uh, this year, but we'd like to be there. Uh, the CARP Fair is uh, is uh, and the Outaouais Electric Auto Show and the Sustainability Showcase and EV are all on the same weekend. Okay, so we've got a bit of an issue there. And uh, but uh, that being said, um, I don't know if if uh, if uh, Regin is still there. Uh, but Regin, Regin was at the. I'm still, um, I'm still here. Yes. Yeah. So Regin, I don't know if you want to talk a bit about your experience in in uh, Montreal and uh, what uh, what that event in Gatineau may end up looking like, given the experience in Montreal. Okay, sure. Yeah, Montreal was a really fantastic weekend. It was a three-day car show. Uh, the total number of people was actually over 42,000, 42,000 and something. That was an incredible number, a record of any record in the past. It was just amazing. Uh, the AVEC, uh, of which I'm part, uh, we had 53 uh, vehicles as to, for test drives uh, during those three days. And every one of those vehicles was booked for every slot that we had, every 20 minutes of every hour that they, they were busy with test drives. We ended up doing 1,750 test drives. So, so we had about 4,000 people because they were allowed two to three people per vehicle. So about 4,000 people got to some test drives during that weekend. So we're, we're quite happy and quite impressed with that. Yeah. The, oh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. The, the interesting thing is that the new uh, vehicles out there, the EV6 especially, was extremely popular. We, we might have had a few hundred more test drives if, if we had had more of those vehicles. We had two of them and it just ran nonstop. The, when the, the doors opened at 10 o'clock an hour later, the EV6 was booked for the rest of the day. The, the Ionic 5 followed shortly after, probably an hour and 15 minutes later, and the ID4 uh, also for Volkswagen was, was booked uh, pretty quickly. Uh, they had about five different uh, uh, Bolt EVs and EVUs there. Uh, they had three Ionic uh, 5, uh, so they had there were lots of cars with like five or six Teslas. Quite exciting, uh, very busy. It was like being in a beehive, you know, trying to line all those people. The lineup would be like a few hundred feet uh, just to get into the place to do those test drives. Now, the, the other event uh, in uh, in Hall, it's going to be at the Palais des Congrès, uh, right downtown uh, Hall uh, on that weekend that you mentioned, the 22nd to the 25th. We hope to repeat what happened in Montreal. Uh, there should be a, a communicate de presse, I guess, a press uh, communication coming out pretty soon. So it's going to hit all of the media, uh, you know, the the spoken or the, the the video media. It's going to be out there pretty soon. And the uh, the guy that's organizing it, he's a professional. He's been doing this for 30 years. So we're working closely with him, trying to line everything up. He's going to have pretty much all of the car dealers uh, around town, especially on the Utah West side participating. So it should be quite an interesting event. And we hope to be able to get as many cars, possibly up to 50 cars to do the test drive because that event uh, guaranteed it's gonna be as busy as the one in Montreal. People are just hungry. They're just crazy about electric vehicles. They, everybody wants one. And of course, you know what the situation is. We just can't get them fast enough. Yeah. Go so ahead. That, yeah. That's pretty much it. So that's that's very exciting, uh, very very exciting, very very impressive results. And and um, so we're gonna have to figure out what what we want to do in terms of participating there. I'd like to have us there, uh, and and contributing cars that are doing test drives, right? Uh, but we'll we'll have to balance that, especially with a sustainable uh, showcase and EV that um, Smartnet Alliance does that we participate in, in every year, essentially, right? So. Um, Anyways, we'll we'll see what we could do, but uh, it, I'm very excited about that show. I will definitely uh, definitely want to be there, <laughs> and we'll, we we'll just have to work out the details, right? Maybe one more <laughs> quick piece of good news. Last uh, Wednesday, uh, uh, two of my uh, friends uh, of the Aveca in the area here, we made a presentation to the libraries of Gatineau. 
uh, through their Zoom and their accommodation, their, their technical accommodation. And we had to close to 100 people who participated and 80 of them stayed with us for an hour and a half that, uh, for, for our presentation. Then we had a half hour uh, question and answer period. That was also very, uh, very good. So people uh, want to know about EVs, that's for sure. Yeah, and that's 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 uh, the perception we got to in 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 um, uh, in Kempville on the weekend that uh, you know people are much much more excited about EVs than they were before. Uh, so uh, you know we are <laughs> we're finally seeing the level of interest that we've been wanting to see for a while, and um, you know as as soon as we could get the cars in, they're going to sell, right? So it's uh, it's fantastic to see. So I'm very very happy about that. Great. So. Um, uh, reminder again, like I said earlier, we do have our uh, newly created uh, EVCO um, uh, YouTube channel that uh, Mike uh, created for us. And We're up uh, what to you... 23 subscribers now. Oh, great. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Doubled in a month. Wow. Doubled in a month. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, uh, we are going to continue uh, posting recordings of meetings there so that uh, you'll be able to get them uh, if you've missed the meeting, right? Uh, or if there is a topic that you want to uh, review later, uh, you know, you, you don't have to watch the whole video. You could watch just a section you want, and you're, you're right? And, and you could do what I do on YouTube is I, I always watch at least at 1.5 speed. Okay, so that way I get I get through more content, but uh, you know that's your choice. You could you could do that too, uh, or um, but anyways, it's available there uh, for you to use. So uh, please uh, uh, take advantage of it. So um, so again, I want to thank the CA for sponsoring us for the um, the wrap uh, on the the trailer. Uh, and again, uh, Sam, uh, you weren't there. I don't know if Sam's still there, but. Uh, Sam wasn't there when I talked about him earlier, but the uh, the guy that he uh, got us to um, uh, to use for the wrap did a, a really good job. Uh, very happy with the job uh, that he did. Uh, went beyond uh, expectations, so it looks really good. And um, and for a really yeah. good price. Yeah, for a really really good price. So uh, so it was fantastic. <laughs> All right. So before we start the roundtable, I just want to thank uh, the people tuning in on YouTube to. Uh, Say thanks for watching and uh, get back to you next month.